Welcome back to Coding Shorts. My name is Sean Wildermuth. Today I want to talk to you about how to build source generators. These are kind of a little bit of a crazy thing of building code when you're actually building the project. And I ran into this with my Minimal API discovery project, the one that'll allow you to structure your APIs in a different way. And I was told that because I was using Reflection, there were some things they couldn't do about optimizing startup time. And so I should look at source generators. And I took a look at them and they're pretty crazy. And it's starting to open up some real interesting ideas for things I want to be doing. And so that's what I'm going to show you today. It's actually going to be the first of a two-parter. Today we're going to build the source generator. And then in the next video, I will go ahead and use some of the metadata to do a more complicated piece of source generation. As always, I wanted to mention you can like and subscribe. That really helps the channel. And I have two in-person courses coming in April and May. You can see the link here on the screen or down in the show notes. Let's get started. So here I am in Visual Studio where we're going to start because it's a little easier to debug these using Visual Studio. And I'm just going to start by building a generator. I'm going to create a new project and I'm going to use a class library project, a plain old class library. And I'll just call it sample generator. And I'm going to put the project in a different folder than the solution. It's not important for what we're doing. It's just organizationally, I think, better in our case. And when you pick the framework, you actually need to pick .NET Standard 2. It doesn't work with any other things. That means these source generators can work across different versions of .NET and .NET Core. And so .NET Standard 2 is how all source generators are actually created. We just start with a simple class. I'm going to get rid of the depth of that namespace. And I'm just going to call it class name generator because where we're headed is to just generate a really simple class that exposes the names of all the classes in a particular file. Incredibly useless, but it'll show us some techniques as we go on. The first thing we're going to run into is that this namespace is going to complain because the version of C Sharp we're using is too young. It's only available in version 10 or greater. And so all I'm going to do here is open up the CS Proj and put Lang version, latest, though I could pick it at one. So in case you're not aware of this, you can use later C Sharp with older frameworks, and that's fine because they're not really in the way of each other, and certainly not in the way for here. And since I have become so used to using C Sharp 10 and 11 features, I wanted to use the latest and greatest. Now let's go ahead and change the name here as well. Class name generator, which I guess I could have changed and would have fixed this for me. And we're going to need some dependencies. So let's go ahead and open up a console. And I'm just going to use .NET add package. And I'm just going to add package Microsoft code analysis C sharp. And I also need analyzers. Now important, this is spelled the American way, not the British way. We like using all our Z's. And now that that's there, we can go ahead and start building this because we're going to need a couple of things. First, we're going to need a attribute called generator. And let's bring in that namespace. And that's in code analysis. We also need to create an I incremental generator. This is the interface that you have to implement in order to do this. There are older versions of source generators that don't use the incremental, but they're really pushing you to use the incremental generator because it's less task intensive on the IDE. And so let's implement that interface. And it looks really naive, right? Let me make this a little bigger. It's just a simple initialize. It should all work fine. And one of the things you'll see here is that this project should add this enforce extended analyzer rules equals true. And so let's go back here and let's add that. And so this is just a property you need to set in the CS Proj itself so that generators can be doing what they want to be doing. And there, our little warning has gone away. So how are we going to get started with this? We're going to start by creating a provider. And we're going to use that context object to call the syntax provider. 
and create syntax provider for us. Now, what is this really doing? It's not doing anything yet because we need to supply a bunch of parameters. But this is essentially saying, I want to create something that as the syntax changes, because this could be run as people are typing up a class, this could be run at build time. It really depends. It only wants to run this once. And so some of the things we're going to be doing here is looking at the syntax tree, not the objects. This is generated as people type and as the build goes. So you don't have an assembly to work from. You only have this thing called a syntax tree that is how Rosalind has broken apart the different pieces of a block of code. And so in that it are gonna be colons and spaces and not necessarily looking for exactly what a class is. And so what we wanna do is be able to create this provider and go, oh, we only care about when something is actually a class. And we're gonna do this by creating two properties on here, predicate and transform. So predicate is going to do a very quick search. And so here I can put something like C comma and the second object I don't really care about because what I wanna do is get this content here and determine whether it is something I care about at all. What we do here is say, what you're passing me, is it a class declaration syntax? So this is a class inside the model of the syntax tree, therefore I care about it. And this way, as the class name generator is working, it may pass you a lot of atoms of the entire code block. And we're gonna say, you know what, if this isn't a class, we're just gonna skip it because we're doing something on class. You could do something a little bit more lengthy to find exactly what you're looking for, but the purpose of this is to be incredibly fast. So it really should be a small amount of information because in transform and later on when we do the gen, you're gonna be able to take this class declaration and expand on it to do things like, let's say we were looking for an attribute or we're looking for a base class or whatever that is. Don't try to do all that work in the predicate. Transform does something similar in that instead of passing you this raw object, sometimes you're gonna to want to change the way the data is gonna be sent in. And this could be quite complicated. The transform could go ahead and gather up information about this class and all these things. But I'm gonna do again something pretty simple to get us started. And all I'm gonna do here is just get the node that we're talking about, the node from the generator syntax content. So this is some piece of code, and I'm actually going to cast it into a class declaration syntax. Now we've confirmed that above here, that this is going to be a class declaration, and all we're doing down here is instead of getting these much more atomic objects, is we're just saying, we're not even gonna get this raw syntax node, we're gonna convert this node so that we can pare down what we're actually working with. And that's a good first step. We have an idea of preparing ourselves for actually looking at the code that's being handed to us. And the last step of this is to just make sure that we don't have a null here. So we're just gonna say whatever's passed to us, m is not null. And this just puts together that this syntax creator doesn't fail in some form where it's gonna give you a null. Because some of the objects that are gonna be passed here may inadvertently not care about it, and you end up with null values here. It's not completely clear if this is needed, but when I was paring down my example, I found it necessary in getting things to work. So I'm not an expert on how these code generators work, but I'm trying to sort of give you a view into doing fairly simple things. So next we're gonna need a compilation. And this is something that allows you to compile some parts of this so you can look at some of the data. This isn't a compilation that's going to generate it all, but what we're going to end up with is some compilation unit that can be compiled with Rosalind during these processes, whether it's behind the scenes as you're typing or whether it's at build time. And we do this by using the context compilation provider and tell it to combine all the objects that our provider has gotten. So this is the point where it, this provider that's going to be listening for it is told, go get all the pieces you have, and then they're gonna combine them into this compilation object so that we can go ahead and use this metadata if you wanna think about it, because this is essentially a replacement for using reflection at runtime. We're using Rosalind syntax tree information at compile time. And so now we can just go to register source output. So we want to write some code here. We're going to start with that compilation. 
And then it's going to need an action, and this action has two pieces, something called a source production context that I'll just call SPC, and I'm going to break this into another line so that we can see it a little better. And then it's going to want to pass us in the source as well. So let's wrap these in some parentheses. And all we're going to do is call some method that we're going to execute on this with the data in there. So execute is going to get the SPC, and then the source is actually a tuple. So we can just say left and source right. Though you could actually, because there is no spec for this execute, I've just gotten used to using them this way. And now we can go ahead and execute this so that the source output will call us when it's ready to actually build that code. And what it's done here has passed us three pieces of information that we're going to use to generate our code. Though in this example, we're not going to do anything too exciting. And so this production context, I'm actually just going to call context. And then this is going to be the compilation because that's what we need it for. And this is going to be the type list, right? Not a big surprise. It says immutable array. And notice that this class that it's a mutable array of is really dependent on us using the transform here to return this. If we needed another kind of object, the type here would match here and here. You could also get one that isn't matched and have to walk down the tree yourself. And so what are we going to do? We're going to create some code. And if you aren't familiar with this literal syntax, it just allows me to create a block of code without worrying about quotes and things like that. I have a video on it, which you can see here, in case you want to understand how that works a little better. And I'm going to create sample source generator as a namespace. Because this might go on an older project, I'm going to go ahead and include the curly braces. And then I'm going to create a public static class that I will call class names. It's called class names because that's what we're going to build in the second part. But we're going to do something really simple here. We're just going to say public static string equals hello from Roslyn. And because we had this code and in here, it's just a text of that code, right? We don't have to think about and create that arbitrary tree ourselves. In fact, the compilation unit will take this string and convert it into that same compilation unit to mix it in with Roslyn at runtime. That's sort of the magic here. And so if we come down here, we can just go to that context object and say add source. And here we're going to need to do a couple of things. And the first one is what they call a hint name. But in our case, we're just going to include the file name here. So I'm going to say class names.g.cs. G is a convention for generated. And so I generally put that. I believe you can also omit these and it'll put the g.cs for you. But I like to be a little clearer. And then I can just say code, right? Make sure it compiles. And what we should get here is that if there are any classes in a project, it should create this project for us. So let's add to our solution something that we can test it with. So let's add new project. I'm just going to use a console app. I'll just call it test generator. And it doesn't matter what version I use. I'm using only the frameworks I have. And I'll go ahead and create it. And let's bring in system.console. So I don't have to write as much. And all I'm going to do here is say using sample source generator, right? And I'm going to say write line class names dot. Oh, this isn't going to work. I didn't give it a name. I'll call it test. Now, unsurprisingly, these are complaining because this and this don't actually exist because we haven't even bound these together. So let's go to test generator and let's add a project reference. So let's grab the reference to the source generator. And that's typically how these things get wired together. And it doesn't know it's a test generator. Normally this hookup would happen in a NuGet package. But for our testing, we're going to need to actually make a change here. Because not only do we want to include the project, we also want to tell it that the item type is going to be an analyzer. It's one of the keys to make it deal with it in the correct way. So let's build. And you'll notice that what we're getting in here are problems with our class name, right? So our generated code here has some issue. So let's make sure we're not short of the things we need. Public class. Oh, I still have the semicolon there. 
Let's go ahead and build it again. And you'll see it succeeded. In fact, if we come back over to program, if we F12 it, we can see the actual code that was generated. And this is the old one. Let's do a complete rebuild because sometimes that helps. Because this can be a little confusing because what happens is it doesn't know that it needs to be generated. And so sometimes while debugging it, I found that I need to, if I go down to my test, let's show all files there and go down here. Not only there's a compiler piece that's missing, right? Because even when we clean these projects, for some reason it's trying to maintain some of that. So I usually get rid of these. We could actually turn something on to make it output the actual file. In this case, it is outputting it in memory. And so when we press F12, it's going and finding it as a temp file instead of actually a file in the project. So let's try building it one more time. Let's see if it's still doing this. Yep to make sure that we saved it, but I'm sure we did. When in doubt, restart Visual Studio. I've seen or I've had the experience of it not really cementing itself together. We see it built fine here. Check, let's run this. And we're getting that hello from Rosalind because that class actually exists. And let's see if we navigate over to it and see that now it's showing fine and it's showing the one that was actually generated by it. So I hate that sometimes we have to do that, but it seems to only really be an impact as you're changing the output file when you're debugging. And so there's no magic there. So hopefully I've shown you kind of how the hints of this source generation works. In part two, we're going to expand on this and actually do something that would do real work. It's not going to be super useful, but at least you'll be able to see how looking at the syntax classes and getting metadata directly from Rosalind during the compilation step will really help you go ahead and build something that might actually be useful. I would love you to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel, helps me get the word out and watch those viewer numbers go up, which really makes it easier for me to justify doing these. So all the help is really appreciated. I also wanted to quickly plug my courses. You probably saw them in the beginning. These are courses on ASP.NET and then a second course on Vue and Vite. You can see the web address here or it's going to be down in the show notes. Thanks for joining me for part one. See you next time.